This is part three of the lecture entitled Linear Systems and Their Diagonalization, where I'll be going into the basics of PET imaging, um, the data acquisition, back projection, sinograms, LISMO data, and the example of convolution. This is just a, a motivating example for better understanding of linear systems and diagonalization. So in PET imaging, we have, for example, an F18 labeled compound, such as fluorodeoxyglucose, that's injected into the subject under study. We know that the fluorin 18 will decay uh, to oxygen 18 with release of two back-to-back -back photon pairs, which arise from annihilation of the positron with any surrounding electron. And so this is just by using e equals mc squared, just the conversion of the rest mass energy of the electron and the positron, which is emitted from the F18, which is a positron emitter, get two back-to-back -back photon pairs. Uh, and those back-to-back -back photon pairs are detected by a PET scanner. And so here I'm just depicting those various back-to-back -back photon pairs coming off from uh, the radioactive distribution inside the brain here. And, uh, and then as we know, what we'll be going into later is how to reconstruct um, from that uh, detected data. So what is the image reconstruction problem in the context of PET? Well, as we've seen, it's uh, radioactivity inside a PET scanner field of view. Um, and the radioactivity, uh, for example, F18 is, is being a positron emitter. It gives off those back-to-back -back photon pairs by e equals mc squared. So we've got all of these back-to-back -back photon pairs being detected by the scanner um, along so-called lines of response where we make these measurements. And the reconstruction problem is going to be saying, well, what is that object or the representation of that object, which in general is going to be a 4D function, um, that, um, that explains that measured data? So often we're going to be looking at uh, estimating, uh, say, 300 million parameters. And so... If you've seen the earlier part of this lecture, you'll know that that's, those parameters are going to be, um, for example, theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, stored in a very tall column vector as coefficients for voxel or pixel basis functions, depending on whether we're doing 2D or 3D. OK, so now I just want to look at the, the 2D example in PET and uh, use that to motivate uh, understanding of linearity, linear shift invariance, convolution, and a very um, basic uh, first model for, for PET data. So here then I've got a radioactive concentration F of XY. It's a point source located here. Um, and this is a positron emitting point source. So it's gonna give off back-to-back -back photon pairs. Here I'm just showing one example of one of the back-to-back emissions from that point source located inside the PET scanner field of view. Uh, so that's the ring of detectors, if you like, of a PET scanner. Uh, typically, as you probably know, the, the ring of detectors in a PET scanner is formed of high-density crystals, which are able to stop quite a large percentage of those high-energy 5-11 keV photons, often by photoelectric absorption or Compton scatter, whatever the interaction might be. But here we're just going to say we've detected we're going to assume we've detected both of them, because that's not always a given either. Assuming we've detected both of them at detector D1 and detector D2. Now, to characterize that line, we can consider our original XY coordinate system, and we can just rotate that system so that that x-axis is now parallel to that line of response along which the two back-to-back -back photon pairs were detected. So that's a rotation angle phi. And then we're going to consider a perpendicular distance S of that line from the center of the field of view. Okay, so we've got that rotation angle phi and a perpendicular distance S. And that means um, we can characterize that line by those two coordinates, S and phi. So uh, if you remember with that rotated system, uh, the y-axis was in that direction, and so this s is actually a negative value here. So that's why we've got a negative. Here's the s-axis on the, um, or the radial axis on the sinogram. We're plotting one count at that particular location for that particular value of s. And phi is some uh, result here corresponding to where we look it up on this phi axis. So we've got this 2D function. Okay, so you've got to view this not as a 1D function, this is a 2D function. 
um, so S and phi, and then we're recording the number of counts uh, at a particular location S and phi. A particular location S and phi corresponds to a line through the scanner field of view. Alternatively, and this is going to be the emphasis of this, um, uh, this particular presentation, we could just simply take an empty matrix in MATLAB, Python, whatever it is your favorite programming language, and just back project uh, along the line um, of detection of those two detection position, positions, D1, D2. And so we just draw a line through an array and call that a back projected image. Um, a third approach is simply let's just store the data D1, D2. And in fact, we can record many other characteristics or attributes of that detected event. So we could have energy of photon one, energy of photon two, the time that it happened. We could even move on to time difference of arrival for time of flight pet. But here we're gonna be focusing on just the simple case of the back projected image. Okay, so let's press on. There's the point source. It's giving off back to back photon pairs isotropically. Uh, we're looking at it in just 2D here though. So another back to back photon pair. That's detectors D3, D4 for the sake of argument. And again, we can characterize that line of detection, that line of response, by a distance S and an angle phi. So S and phi characterize a line through the scanner field of view. We just detected one count along that line. And so we can plot that count as a value of one. We're just adding on a value of one to this sinogram, which is effectively histogramming or binning or collecting those detected PET back-to-back uh, -back photon pairs. And then the back projected image, we can just draw a line according to the line of response along which the event was detected. And in the list mode data, we can just record again, the information it could be a different energy, of course, for each of the photons, different time point, different detection positions, and so on. Okay, uh, third, third uh, positron emission gives rise to a third back-to-back -back photon pair, uh, which we detect. Of course, it's a bit, a bit misleading to say third positron emit emission, because there would have been probably you know, hundreds of thousands of them uh, per moment in time. Um, and we're only gonna be detecting a very small fraction of them according to the sensitivity of our scanner. But anyway, for the sake of argument, back-to-back -back photon pair for a third detection gives rise to a third count on our sinogram here. This is just histogramming events. We could just back project the line here in the back projected image and collect the data in the list mode data output. So what we've got here are three formats of data that you'll come across in the context of PET imaging. Um, list mode data, back projected images and sinograms, but really sinograms and list mode are the most popular and widespread used format, although back projected images are beginning to come back into fashion a bit in the context of time of flight PET. Anyway, for this video, let's just focus on this simple back projected image. Here, after six back-to-back -back, um, photon pairs, we've now got six counts in the sinogram, six lines back projected in the back projected image, and six events in the list mode data. By the time of 1,000 events, uh, we've now got 1,000 counts, and you can now see why a sinogram is called a sinogram, because a point source, when you've got all these back-to-back -back photon pairs being detected, and when you uh, look at all the S phi coordinates of all those lines and plot them in a histogram, you get a sine wave response for a point source. Uh, the back, pro back projected image is now this kind of intersection of all of those lines, and it's a kind of like a 1 over r kind of function. It would be something like a 1 over r squared in uh, 3D. The point is it's not a delta function. It does actually have a blurred response there. So a linear system will mean that if we have multiple point sources in the PET scanner field of view, we now get um, a linear superposition of all the separate sine wave responses that we, what, that we would have got from independent measurement of all of those point sources, from independent measurement of each one of those point sources. And the back projected image is just now the superposition of all of those, um, uh, if you like, uh, back projected intersection Points. So each one of these is a bit like one of those 1 over r functions. Here though we've limited counts, I think it's only about 10,000. We're, we're kind of limited by noise here and we will be considering noise in great detail at a later point. Um, and the list mode data just keeps going on well off the 
bottom of the slide here. Okay, so this now then um, motivates a simple model for bat projected images in PET. Um, you'll notice that each and every one of the point sources inside the PET scanner field of view has been replaced by what's often called a point spread function. I prefer point response function, but often you'll hear it called a PSF or a point spread function. And so um, this is an example of a, a linear shift invariant mapping that's going on here because it doesn't matter where the point source is, the, the shape of the function response in the output back projected image, the shape is the same, it's just that it's shifted to the corresponding location of where the point source was inside the scanner field of view. So convolution, which we'll be going into in a bit more detail, is a great model for that. In other words, it's a linear shift invariant system. It's a great way of modeling a back projected uh, PET image in 2D. Now, by linearity, um, any arbitrary object inside a scanner field of view can just be regarded as a collection of point sources of different intensities. So that circle there is a collection of point sources just arranged in a nice pattern so we get a uniform distribution and likewise for the line and the square and those two points. Linear system means that when we collect all the back-to-back -back photon pairs, what we get in the sinogram output is just the linear superposition of all the separate point source responses. Again though here, very dominated by Poisson noise, which later on we will be getting into and dealing with that in, in the context of maximum likelihood reconstruction. But again, for this video, I want you to focus on that back projected image. And now you can see that whereas before those point sources, it might have looked like we could do some kind of threshold and do a really quick and nasty reconstruction. You can see here, the impact of that blurring means that you know, our quantification has gone right out the window. You know, if you look at the true object here, these point sources are hotter than the circle and the um, square, and if they're hotter, in other words, it means there's more activity, they're, they're greater intensity. Look at the back projected image, the intensity's dropped right down relative to, the, uh, relative to that circle and square. So this is not a quantitative image, it's gonna need uh, proper reconstruction processing. So another general, uh, more general distribution, again, regard, can be regarded as a collection of point sources at different amplitudes, um, gives rise to a far denser sinogram, which again is just the linear superposition of all the single point source responses, but now again, heavily subject to noise. Back projected image looks like this, and this mode data, of course, I've not been updating that now. Um, so all that to say that this back projected image that we've been looking at, it can be modeled by 3D, or in this case, 2D actually, convolution. So what we're saying is um, the following, I'll give some graphics here, which will hopefully clarify it. Here then is that back projected image that we've been looking at in the previous slides. I've just shown the example here of a few point sources for clarity. So we're gonna call this an intensity G as a function of position R, so if you imagine that's just X and Y coordinates on that image. And what we're saying is we get that output by the input um, distribution. So again, this is just all cast in a continuous framework. Um, we'll be working more on discretization again when we get to iterative reconstruction, but just to cast this in a continuous framework, so therefore an integral equation rather than a matrix vector equation. Um, so we've got the input true distribution, which is a radioactive concentration F as a function of position R prime. So R prime, imagine that as X prime, Y prime, just allows us to visit each and every location X and Y. We're tagging them with primes because we just wanna visit each of them in this integral. Um, we visit each location, and when we visit each location, we use the intensity F Okay, so here the intensity in these, for these regions is zero, but when we hit a point source as we scan through this array, here the intensity would be, for example, one or some finite value. And so F gives us that value, and that can be regarded then as a weighting factor for this point spread function or this response function H of R. But the point spread function or the response function H of R is shifted to the location R prime 
of uh, the point source that we're looking at. So imagine here, this is a particular R prime or X prime, Y prime value. And so to, to get the output there, what we do is we take the intensity of that point source, there's the intensity at that location, R prime, and we just use that as a scaling factor, a weighting factor, a coefficient for the point spread function, H of R, shifted um, to that location, X prime, Y prime. So here, in fact, I've got now the demonstration of a single point response function, okay? And so, if you like, that's H of R, which is shifted to that location there um, and scaled by the intensity of that point source to deliver the output there. And we get the whole of that output, G of R, just by repeating exactly that process. Just look at all of the locations here, all of the locations R prime, look up the value F, and then use that value F as the scaling for the point spread function HR. Here's the point spread function HR. And then of course that point spread function just needs to be shifted to whichever location X prime, Y prime that we are considering. And of course we've got to sum that all up with the integral here over all of the positions R prime, in other words, uh, X prime, Y prime. And that will then give us the output which is just a convolution. This is a linear shift invariant system. Uh, we'll see elsewhere, I think, that that can be nicely written in discrete form as a matrix vector multiplication where we discretize G, discretize F, and we would just duplicate discrete versions of that point spread function, um, just shifted to every single possible location and use that to populate the columns of the matrix H but I should show that elsewhere as a more explicit example of how you put a linear shift invariant mapping uh, discretized into a matrix form. So that's all I wanted to cover in this part of the lecture. Um, the next part for this lecture is part four, and uh, there we're gonna be looking into the importance of the Fourier transform and understanding um, sinusoidal functions as eigenfunctions or eigenvectors for linear shift invariant operators or systems. Um, and then we'll look into the discrete Fourier transform in matrix vector form and then consider uh, basis vectors, delta basis and the Fourier basis. Meanwhile, thanks for listening to this part of the lecture. Thank you.